Yes, sir. That's good. Those old writers like Isaac Watts, John Newton, my, they go back a long time. That was a long time for them, but not any of a day for the Lord. Amen. It's good singing, good singing. Turn to the book of Matthew chapter 22 with me tonight, please. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter number 22 and verse number 42. Matthew 22, verse 42. Well, we'll start reading verse number 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? Speaking from their understanding of the Bible, they answered, The son of David. And he saith unto them, Now look at this. This is, this is a key to understanding the Bible. This is why I keep telling you the Bible is a remarkable book. Now look at verse number 43. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord? Yes. Saying, The Lord said unto my Lord. Now notice the text here. Look at verse number 44. The first Lord is a capital L-O-R-D. You see that? All right, that's printer's type. That means Jehovah. All right, now look at the next one. The Lord, Jehovah, said unto my Lord, all right, that's Adonai, the small case, the small case, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Yes. Now look at verse 45. If David then called him Lord, how is he his son? See, yes. see, this is for anyone who approaches the Bible in a natural manner. In other words, you say, well, everything in the Bible can be explained naturally or or you can think it through or something of that nature. If David then called him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. <laughs> Took care of that, didn't it? <laughs> Father, bless his holy book now. In thy name I pray. Amen. There is the pre-incarnate Christ which in most of the time is referred to as the angel of the Lord. This is called a theophany. To be more technical, it's called a Christophany. What's that mean? That means it's a manifestation of God. It's God appearing as an angel. So what does an angel look like when it appears? There's a thousand different ways that an angel can appear. A thousand different ways. Even to this time, the Bible said, be careful that you may entertain an angel unawares. So I know it's, uh, you see angels with wings and usually in the feminine gender and this and that. Well, that's all beautiful. But the truth of the matter is, that's simply a small, small, small part of what the Bible has to say about angelos. That's the Greek word for it, an angelos, an angel, an angel. So he said, how does he call him Lord? How does, uh, how does David call him Lord if David is centuries older than he is? It has to do with his incarnation, and it has to do not only that, but with a manifestation to David, to David, for him to understand that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel is far, far, far above a simple understanding. That's what's going on here. And so they didn't ask him any more questions, and rightfully so. A lot of times questions are simply asked out of curiosity. There's nothing wrong with being curious. But the truth of the matter is, he said to Pontius Pilate, he said to Pilate, he said, Pontius Pilate, he said, don't you know that I have power to crucify you and I have power to turn you loose? The Lord Jesus said to Pilate, you have no power over me whatsoever except it were given to thee from above. And Pilate thought about what he had just said to him. Though he were a, a, a procurator, which essentially was a type of governor that represented Rome in that area. And he understood that he was talking to a man that was far above the ones that sent him up. You have no power over me. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed whatsoever. And Pilate therefore respected him, took him out and said, I find no fault in this man. No fault in him. Find no fault in him. And the reason he did is because Pilate was not a Jew. Pilate was not steeped in Jewish religion. Pilate simply dealt with the man as the man. He looked at him as the man he was dealing with. And he understood he had a man standing before him. He knew that. That's why he washed his hands and said, I'm not guilty of what's happening here. 
In Matthew chapter number 2 and verse number 2, we find the Magi coming from the east. And uh, here's what they said about him. What think you of Christ? Here's what they said. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Yes, they came from the east. And they said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? A little study in the east reveals the fact that the Chaldeans, they were in the Babylonian, but the Chaldeans were the priesthood. And they were the ones who studied the stars and the prophecies and all of that. And they came from the east, no doubt had had access to the book of Daniel, because at one time they'd been, uh, they'd been in captivity. And Daniel, of course, wrote about him, especially in Daniel chapter number 9, told them when he was going to be born. Yeah. King of the Jews. In Matthew chapter number 8 and verse number 29, what think ye of Christ? Well, here's what the spirit world says about him. Matthew chapter number 8 and verse number 29, we do well to pay heed. Listen to this message. This is one of the best messages you'll ever hear preached. Listen to its preached. And behold, they cried out saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Who in the world, preacher? Devils, demons. They know who he is. They know. Who. Even if the pastor of their church doesn't know who he is, the demons know who he is. The spirit world, you better believe it. Son of God. In book of Matthew chapter number 9 and verse number 3, when we get steeped in religion, here's what it says. And certain of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemeth. He's a blasphemer. He's a blasphemer. And so let me ask you a question. I'm speaking to them 2,000 years ago. What do you base your faith upon? You see, they had what's called the Torah or the Tanakh, the Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi. But what did they really believe? Not that they believed the oral report or the oral scriptures, which became the basis of the Talmud that they have today. And if they want to reject Christ, they don't go to the Bible. You'll never find a Jew on the face of this earth that can take the scripture and use it as a basis for rejecting Christ. They can't do it. They can't do it because you can show them in the scriptures that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah. No question. Fulfill the prophecies. So what do they use? The Talmud. They use the Talmud, the oral tradition that became the Talmud. So they said, this man blasphemeth. Well, he's not blaspheming against the Bible. It's against their Talmud. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 9, in verse number 27, here's what they say. When Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. Thou son of David, have mercy on us. Son of David means that they're Jews, and they identify themselves with him. David's the king. David's the king that God told in the Old Testament, I will perpetuate your throne throughout, throughout eternity. There never shall fail a man to sit upon the throne of the house of David. And my friend, they knew this. And they said, uh, you're a son of David. Now look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 55. And we're all guilty of this. Here's what these said about him. Matthew chapter number 13. Matthew chapter number, uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 55. If I can find it here. Matthew 13, 55. Here's what it says. Matthew 13, 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? This is his family. And if you'll remember studying the Bible, his family thought it was crazy. They, they came one day to take him and put him up. Take him away. He's, he, he's not, he, he just doesn't have all of his marbles. And the Lord Jesus Christ looked at his disciples and said, this is my family right here. He gave them an open rebuke, including his mother, and thought he was crazy. And notice carefully here in his home, they said, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother Mary? In other words, familiarity. The Bible says a prophet hath no honor in his own country. You ever notice how that somebody from a foreign country or a foreign state or from foreign, foreign, foreign is always better equipped and smarter and can sing better and this and that and this and that? That when you watch one grow up, you always identify yourself with that person and you can't imagine that somebody would grow up in the same town you did and it's got more gifts and power and smarter than you are. <laughs> how many agree with that tonight? <laughs> That's a tough one. Yes, it is. Well, I grew up with so-and-so. And so the idea is that you're comparing yourselves with yourselves and you're not wise. Is he the carpenter's son? No. No, no, no. He was not Joseph's son, not in any sense of the word. You remember when Mary said, what have you done this to us? Why have you done this? 
when they had gone and he wasn't with their company and they went back to Jerusalem. Why did you do us like this? Wished you not? Wished you not? I mean, your mother and your father have been looking for you. And the Lord Jesus looked back into the face of Mary and said, Wished you not that I must be about my father's business? Oh, yeah. He reminded her right there that Joseph was not his father. His father was God Almighty. And so he's the carpenter's son. In the book of Matthew chapter 14 and verse number 12. Matthew 14 verse 12. Let's see here. Matthew chapter 14. Let's see. Let me get the right chapter. I don't think I've got the right reference here. Let me go back and look at it again. Okay. Matthew 16, 14. Matthew 14, 14, 2. I'm sorry. Matthew 14, 2. Now look at verse number 1. At that time Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his, unto his serpents, This is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. For Herod had laid hold on John, bound him, and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. And that, of course, is what John the Baptist had rebuked him over. He said, it's not right for you to take your brother Philip's wife. And so he gave up to Herodias, and uh, the daughter, of course, danced before him, and Herod's passions were inflamed. And so he handed her, at her request, the head of John the Baptist on a charger that ate him alive for the rest of his life. Here is a man so full of guilt and superstition. He said, this is John the Baptist. He's come back to haunt me. That's what he was saying. That's exactly what he was saying in chapter number 14. You know, it's amazing how people think that they can do things and get away with it and just live a, create a new life. This is happening all the time now. One man killed his wife and his girls, put them in a big container. You remember that man? And for his girlfriend... And, and, and he thought that he could start a new life by doing that. And, of course, they found him out. And he's in prison now serving a life sentence for murder. And what kind of a life are you going to build when, build when you kill a bunch of people? When you murder your wife or murder your children? Bishop did that. He did that in the, in, in the early 80s or the late 70s. I remember exactly when it happened. I mean, I remember hearing about it over here in the Smoky Mountains. He came down from Connecticut or Maryland or somewhere up there. He had killed his, I think he killed his mother-in-law. He killed his wife. He killed his children. And he drove them down here. And he buried their bodies and then set a fire. And then he took off. And he was a, he was a former State Department or former uh, employee of the federal government. He's a very smart man. Very smart. And do you know what? To this day, they haven't caught him. To this day. He's lived all these years. He murdered his wife and murdered his children. I wouldn't swap places with him for all the gold in the world. He has had to live every day of his life tormented with that thought. I wonder if the face of his wife rings in, fa in his face. I wonder if he remembers his little children, what he did to them, what he did to them. That one I mentioned a moment ago, they killed his, he killed his daughters. His daughter saw the other daughter die and she looked at her daddy and said, Daddy, are you going to do that to me? Yeah, you little child. Monster. Are you going to, yeah, a monster. Yeah. A monster. Yeah. yeah. You ever thought about why God created hell? Yeah. There's a reason for it, folks. Right. There's a reason for it. Amen. Yes, sir. Are you going to do that to me, Daddy? Yeah, Daddy did. He murdered his little girl. Boy, boy, boy. The son of a national known evangelist. Son of a nationally world known evangelist killed his two sons and then himself and he did it in spite work because his family was broken up. I think they'd already divorced. I'm not sure, but either he had been, they were divorced or going through the proceedings. <coughs> but he killed his two sons and they were teenage boys and one of them was gifted in music. This fine young man growing up just now starting in life and he murders them and then kills himself all to have spite work on his wife. Yeah, he did. You, you, you ever wonder why God made hell? Yeah. In the book of uh, Matthew chapter number 16 and verse number 14, Matthew 16 verse 14. 
Matthew 16, 14. I'm, I'm a believer, folks, just to be as honest as I know how. I'm a believer in judgment. I believe there's a hell. And I believe that every soul that ever goes there fully deserves to be there. Matthew chapter number 16 and verse number 14. Let's look at this. Matthew 16, 14. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Well, some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, so one of the prophets. We can understand that. I mean, they hadn't received a special revelation from God. You see, my dear friend, Old Testament prophets perform miracles. Elijah performed miracles and Elisha performed twice as many miracles as Elijah did. They even raised the dead, but they were not God. They were not God. But he saith unto them, whom say ye that I am? If you want to know who he is, forget the Jesus seminar. How many's ever heard of that bunch? Jesus seminar. Who are these? These are so-called scholars I think they meet once a year, and they, they survey the historical record of Christ and everything relating to it to try to determine, first of all, did he really live? If he lived, who is he? You know, how can we relate to him now? And let me tell you where to find out who he is, all right? Walk into the midst of a church full of born-again believers where the Holy Ghost is free to move in their midst that have been there, that have met him face to face, Amen. and they know whom they have believed. They don't need any man to tell them who he is. I don't, need, I don't need any scholar to tell me who Christ is. I know whom I have believed. And Peter said, thou art the Christ. You're the Mashiach. Then he goes on to say, the son of the living God. And here's what the Lord said to him. Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. There we are. No man knows the Son but the Father. No man knows the Father but the Son. And to whom he will reveal him. It's the Father's purpose through the Holy Spirit to tell you who the Lord Jesus Christ is. To this very day, folks, go out here and survey the average citizen and say, who is Jesus Christ? Well, you know, he was a good man and prophet and and he, and he showed, taught us a lot of great things. And, and I believe, I, you know, I just believe he's a wonderful man. That's what you're going to get on the street. Or some will say, well, he never lived. He's a figmentation of your imagination, this and that and this and that. But who do you say that he is? You folks sitting in here tonight, who do you say he is? Is there any doubt in your mind? No doubt in my mind. None whatsoever. He's the Christ, the son of the living God. Amen. Jews understood what that meant. You, being a man, makes your, maketh yourself God? When he said he was the son of God, the Jews, it shook them to their core. Said, you're just a man? And you make yourself equal with God? They understood what it meant to be the son of God. Yeah. They did. They understood what that meant. And so they said that to him. Yes, the son of the living God. I like what Simeon said, though. Luke chapter number 2 and verse number 30. What think ye of Christ? Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Luke chapter number 2 and verse number 30. Luke 2, 30. Now we're talking about an old man, verse 25, whose name was Simeon. All right? With two old folks that hung around the temple. One of them was Simeon. And who's the other one? Anna. Yes, the woman and the man. And if you notice in verse number 30, he lifted up the baby. In verse 28, he took him in his arms. He blessed God. Now look at this. He said, now let us thou thy servant, verse 29, depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen what? See that? He had a clearer understanding of who this was than any of the rest of them. In plain words, he said, salvation is not doing something. Salvation is not where you go and who leads you there. Salvation is this little baby I'm holding in my hands right here. He's just a baby, but that's my Savior. That's what Simeon was saying. Yes, sir. 
And the Bible says in 1 John chapter number 5, He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. Now, you know, that's too simple for folks, don't you think? You mean to tell me, preacher, that everything that has to do with salvation is wrapped up in one person? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. One person. Only one person. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. That at the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Amen, folks. There's just one name, just one Lord and one God. Luke chapter number four, they called him Joseph's son. They like to associate him with an earthly father. They, they like that because therefore he's just one of them. See, that's the idea. If they associate him with Joseph and Joseph is his father, then you're just, you're just one of us. What's, what, how do you get all blown up here? What, I mean, who do you think you are anyhow? We know who you are. You're the carpenter's son. We've watched you grow up. We know, you, look here, well, you've been in Nazareth. Can it, Nathaniel said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? That's right. That's what Nathaniel said. And the Lord Jesus said of Nathaniel, he said, an Israelite in whom is no guile. And he said, Nathaniel, when you were under the tree, I saw you. Yeah. <laughs> and got a hold of his attention. Yeah. Yes, sir. And Nathaniel, folks, was a good man. He was a true believer. He, the Lord said that in whom is no guile. He spoke clearly from his soul. So Simeon got it right. Here's what John the Baptist said about him in John chapter number 1 and verse number 29. John 1, 29. I don't know if you all know it yet, but I have the greatest respect for John the Baptist. <laughs> I do. I do. He ate locusts and wild honey. I mean, he was rough on every edge. And when he preached, he skint the bark off of the trees. <laughs> Generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, he said to them. Oh, yeah. And they said to him, who gives you the authority to preach like this? Where did you come from? John the Baptist. Here's what he said about him in verse number 29. John chapter number 1. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, look, behold the Lamb of God. Which taketh away the sin of the world. Yes, sir. Did John get it right? You agree with that? Oh, yeah, I do. Oh, yeah, I do. That means I've got a lamb. Oh, yeah, I've got a lamb. And for me to offer blood sacrifice today is an abomination to God. You know that? If I took a lamb, slew it, and took its blood and sprinkled it on an altar somewhere, I would be making a mockery of the one eternal salvation and sacrifice for the sins of man. Amen, folks. One time, once and forever. Yes, the Lamb of God. Uh, over here in John chapter number one, here's what Andrew said about him. There's a lot of boys named Andrew. How many of you noticed how many boys are named Andrew? Andrew's a good name. John chapter number one and verse number 41. Here's what it says. Now, if you look at verse 40, and one of the two which heard John speak following was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Okay, you remember this who now? He's his brother. All right, this is, this is Simon Peter's brother. Andrew was not, you know, outspoken like Peter was. But they, they were the same. They were the same brother. Now, look at verse number 41. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, Mashiach the Messiah, the Christ, which is being interpreted the Christ. Now, what does that mean? Well, 2,000 years ago, the Messiah meant a lot of different things to the people, even his own disciples, having followed him for three years. One of the last things they said to the Lord Jesus was, Wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? This is what the Messiah is supposed to do. When will you do this? They, it took them a long time to get a hold of the fact that what God does with the sinner and with your sin is far more important than restoring the kingdom to Israel. Now, that's not to belittle it because when he restores the kingdom to Israel, Christ is going to sit in Jerusalem and he's going to reign over the earth. But here's the problem with Messiah. A lot of people can believe he's the Messiah, but it doesn't necessarily believe, uh, mean that he's the son of God. You see, there's nothing higher you can believe about the Lord Jesus Christ than to say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Simon Peter said, You're the Messiah, you're the Messiah, the anointed one of God. 
But he said, let me add here, let me go a little higher than that. You're the son of God. To this day, the Jews, the scholarly Jews that study their Old Testament say that the Old Testament teaches two messiahs. Why? Because one messiah suffers and dies and the other messiah rules and reigns. And they cannot, they cannot, they cannot make them square with each other. How's this, how does this work? And so they have two of them. But you see, the Lord Jesus Christ is both of them. He suffered at his first coming. He'll rule and reign at his second coming. And he will reign. He will reign. He said, if you suffer with me, you'll reign with me. The Bible said they lived and reigned with Christ, Christ for a thousand years. That's called the millennium or millennium. It's a thousand year reign. This is why we're called millennialist. And I'm a premillennialist. What's that mean? I believe the Lord's going to come back before the millennium. And I believe when he comes back before the millennium, he comes back according to the mystery that God revealed to the apostle Paul when he called him as the apostle to the Gentiles. And what is that mystery? It is the mystery of the rapture of the church of the living God. We've been here 2,000 years. He's not reigning in this world right now. And we're not making the world a better place. This, and then they're good people out there listening to me right now. And they're kingdom builders. They think that they're going to change this wicked, vile, godless earth and world into a, into a, into a believer in God and Christ. And they're not. No, no the millennium says the knowledge of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's for a thousand years that that's going to happen. And the Bible says, neither will any man teach his brother saying, know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. And he said, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel in those days. No longer will my law be written in stone that cannot answer, cannot feel. He said, my law will be written in their hearts. Jeremiah prophesied that. It's coming, it's coming folks. There's gonna be a millennium. There's gonna be a reign. The Lord Jesus is coming back. Amen, amen. I, I'm about, I guess about every Christian I've ever known, regardless of whether they're pre, post, or all, they believe he's coming back. But there's that mystery. He said, ye shall not all sleep, but you shall be changed. He said in 1 Thessalonians 4, we're not appointed to wrath, but obtain salvation. That salvation is not being saved again. It's being saved from the wrath of God. And that wrath is what? It's that tribulation period, the time of Jacob's trouble. And it's seven years long, and it's coming. It's coming. Every day that I wake up anymore, I see something. I say to myself, good night. I can't, this is, I mean, it overtakes you. This, um, that thing I was telling you about this morning, the artificial intelligence, AI. Yeah. When you get home, Google Korean mother, Korean mother. And I don't know if you can find it this way. I saw it on a news cast, but it shook me to my core. I had never in my life seen anything like this. Korean mother through AI, through artificial intelligence, talks to her departed daughter and the departed daughter is like it's like a garden and the little girl comes running up to her and there's the mama standing there looking at her little girl her little girl looks up at her and of course they're speaking in korean i don't understand a word of it but the mother breaks down and begins to pour out her heart because she's looking this is real what the mother's doing is real because she thinks she's looking at her departed daughter that has been brought back to life through artificial intelligence. That's interesting. Look at it. And look at, look at what it portends. Look at the thoughts about what's following. There's some stuff is going on right now, folks, that is a quantum leap from five years ago. Right? It really is. It'd blow your mind. Well, in John chapter number four, in verse number 19, John 4, 19, The woman at the well, she's a Samaritan. You all know where the Samaritans came from. John 4, 19, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. How would she know he was a prophet? He said, you've been married five times, and the man you're with now is not your husband. <laughs> and you're coming over here in the, in the heat of the day to this well because none of the women want to be around you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was the case with this woman. She says, I perceive you're a prophet. Yeah, he is a prophet, folks. Amen. Yep. Moses said, the Lord your God shall raise up unto thee a prophet like unto me. He's a prophet. The Lord Jesus is a prophet. He prophesied. But you and I both know he's in a, he's in a level much higher than any prophet that ever lived on this earth. Oh, yeah. In the Jews in John 6, 42, the sixth chapter of John and the eighth chapter of John are two of the, 
are two of the most confrontational chapters in the Bible, especially chapter 8. The 8th chapter of John is when the Lord Jesus Christ confronts the Jews, and I mean he lets them have it. He said in John 8, 44, You are of your father the devil, and the works of your father you shall do. As a liar from the beginning, abode not in the truth. When he lies, he does his own. He's a liar. And they said, We not be born of fornication. John 8 threw that in his face. We know who your daddy is. Yeah. He had said to them, before Abraham was, I am. Right there, before he was, I am. They didn't like that. So they reminded him that they believed that he was illegitimate. They threw it in his face. He said, my father is not your father, and my God is not your God. So the Jews said, he's Jesus, the son of Joseph. John 6, 42. In John 8, 48, here's what they said. Remember what I just told you about the confrontation. Now, here's what they said to him. John 8, 48. John chapter number 8 and verse number 48. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? You're demon-possessed. You're Samaritan. You're not a Jew, they said to him. Now, I want you to take what you just read right there and lay it down. And that's the basis for what the Talmud teaches about the Lord Jesus Christ right here. You're reading it. Yes, you're reading it. He was demon-possessed, according to them, and they have a, a lot more to say about him. He was the son of a Roman soldier. They call him Ben Pantera. A lot of other things that are mentioned in the Talmud about him. And this is why when you try to talk to a Jew about their soul and about the Lord Jesus Christ... The Bi they can never use the scripture against you to argue their point. They've got to run to the Talmud. See, that's, that's the tradition. You've made the word of God of none effect by your traditions. When the Lord Jesus said that to the Jews 2,000 years ago, not a word of the Talmud had been written. But it was known in the hearts of the people. They learned it from generation to generation to generation until it was finally written down. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? They're the ones who gave us the Old Testament. And you try to lead one to the Lord from the Old Testament, and they'll run from it. They'll run to their Talmud. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. The Old Testament. Of course, they don't call it that. To call it, if, they, if, a Jew, if a Jew says that there is an Old Testament, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tacit agreement that there is a New Testament. You see? And he, never, he does not recognize a New Testament. That's a Gentile creation. You see, it's not inspired scripture. The Jews do not believe for one moment that any of those 27 books are inspired. Just the Tanakh, which means from Genesis through Malachi. So that's what you deal with when you're talking to one of them. That's, that's, that's the issue. So the blind man in John 19, John 9 rather, said he's a prophet. And I like the way this reads, if you want to turn there, John 9 John chapter number 9 and uh, verse number 17. Verse, let's read in verse 16. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. And they say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they recalled the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son whom you say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. You control the masses of people by fear. That's the way you do it. How many of you understand that you're living in a culture of fear now? How many of you understand that? You understand that if there's certain words you use, certain phrases you use, certain things you say, you're going to lose your job. 
You're going to be ostracized. Your throat's going to be cut. All right. That's the culture that you're living in right now. Right now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's, that's, uh, that's the way it goes. Why they still let us preach here? Because they give you a semblance of freedom until they get ready to shut the churches down. They'll come when they shut them down. That we even march, we, we, we march to their tune, sing their song, uh, agree with their, with their doctrine, or we're finished. There's no place left for us. No place left for us whatsoever. You live in a climate of fear. That's how Adolf Hitler controlled Germany. Fear. That's how Mussolini controlled Italy. Fear. That's how the Chinese Communist Party controls China. Fear. That's how Iran is controlled by the mullahs. Fear. 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 And people, are, for the most part, are scared to death, the blind man. But look at this, verse number 35. They cast him out. They excommunicated him, kicked him out. And when Jesus heard that they'd cast him out, verse 35, when he'd found him, he said unto him, he comes to the point, doesn't he? Dost thou believe in the Son of God? Now, is he identifying himself here as the Son of God? Of course he is. He answered an honest answer. Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. Amen. What did he do here, preacher? He lifted him far above any Judaism on this earth, any temple on this earth, any religion that existed. He said, Do you believe on the Son of God? Yea, Lord, I believe then they're beneath you because what you have, you didn't get from them and it can't be taken away from you. And from that day forward, a new man. And so in John chapter number 12 and verse number 13, we'll close here tonight and listen to this. John chapter number 12 and verse number 13. Verse 12, and the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him. I've been to Israel five, maybe six times. I can't remember now. But their graveyards are not like our graveyards. They have palm leaves. They decorate their graves with palm leaves. They do that. This is, this is part of the culture. And so when they laid the palm leaves in front of him, they were saying, this is the most respectful thing we have. This is important. We are saying to you, we put our trust in you. See, they put the palm leaves before him. And here's what they said in verse 13. They took palm leaves, trees, branches of palm trees, and went forth to meet him, cried, Hosanna, that means save now. Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Isn't that amazing how they were ready to crown him as the king of Israel? And just a few days later, they screamed, crucify him. Don't ever follow the mob. The mob's always wrong. Don't ever follow the mob. Remember, most of the time, the mob is controlled by fear. They are. They're controlled by fear. They're controlled by fear. Get on your knees and ask the Holy Spirit. Ask him this question tonight if you're in doubt, if, you, if, you know, if you're not sure. Just say, who is Jesus of Nazareth? Who is he? Show me who he is. You know, I believe this. I firmly believe in going to God and if you want to know something, ask him. Ask him. Ask him. Who is this man? Never a man spake like this man, they said of him. Never a man spake like this man. He's different from all men. Who is this man? Who is this? Give him time to answer you. And when he does, he'll answer you in a place, a time, a method, whatever is his choosing. And most of the time, it'll be least expected but when the answer comes, you'll know it because he can speak to you like nobody else can speak to you. And I think he does it because he wants you to know it's him doing it. To understand, who is he? Who is this man, this Nazarene? Who is this man? Who is he? Who you believe he is is important. When we come to church, every time we come to church, we drive by Jehovah's Witness building. I don't hate these people. Many of them are probably giving the shirt off their back, you know, moral people and all that. No question about that. This is not about that. But if you ask them who Jesus Christ is, here's what they'll tell you. Oh, oh, 
prophet, great teacher, wonderful man. Uh, the greatest of Jehovah's creation. Mm -hmm. They make him a creature. Jehovah created him above everything, but he's a creature. They're wrong. Amen. Jesus Christ is the creator. Amen. Father, bless your word tonight. Thank you for the little time we have together. Now in Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 All right.